Five years ago, when my wife and I bought our house, I wasn't aware of the fact that I'd become neighbors and friends with one of the greatest marketing minds here in Utah, Alex MacArthur. Most notably and recently, Alex was the CMO of Purple, the mattress company, and helped lead that company from a $6 million startup in 2015 to over $300 million today and publicly traded. His creative teams have been at the heart of many YouTube videos, which garnished millions of views as well. He'll be the first to tell you he's not a designer, but he is someone who's interviewed and hired some of the best. Give today's episode a listen to hear all about what a brilliant marketing mind looks for in his creative team hires. Alex MacArthur. How are Thank you? you for coming on, on design, design today. today. I'm pumped to be here. Uh, do people know we're neighbors? Uh, probably not. I'll maybe I'll say that in the introduction. introduction. Yes, yes, at this point in time, they do know we're neighbors. Okay, they know we're neighbors. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome, though. Alex, you've... Uh, let me back up a little bit. When I started the Design Today podcast, I recognized that there was a lot of people that I've met, networked, who have been very successful in their careers. And knowing the conversation that you and I have had over the last couple of years, I recognize the skill set that you have, uh, the breadth of knowledge that you have. And in starting the show, I wanted to be able to capture that kind of knowledge and be able to share it with a broader audience. So from a very early time in design today, you were on my list of people who I wanted to have on the show. Um, and you've texted me many times and I've ignored you a couple of times, responded a few. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't matter because here we are today and you're on the show and this is an awesome opportunity. And for those who are listening, they're going to get a lot out of this interview. Hope so. Um, I wanted to give you just a quick couple minute or two to introduce a little bit more of your professional career, um, a little bit of where you came from and how you got to where you're at today. Cool. Um, so most people are probably familiar with, uh, out of all my jobs, the, the most recent one, which was Purple. I was the CMO there, uh, purple.com. If you haven't heard of it, we sell comfort products, mattresses, sheets, um, you know, seat cushions, a few other things. So mm -hmm. didn't exist in 26 or 20, the end of 2015. I started as a consultant in October of 2015. We launched in January of 2016. Um, and I don't, I don't want to use an overused term, but like, it's almost a household name. I don't think it's quite there, but in three years we've gone from, you know, non-existent to something, you know, if I wear my t-shirt in the airport, people have heard of purple. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, my LinkedIn has been bombarded since purple took off and like nonstop, like people just wanted to do a collaboration or influencer project or advertisers yep. reaching out. Um, prior to that, I, you know, did some agency work, uh, helped start a small business agency called Orange Soda mm -hmm. uh, here in our network yep. in Utah. That's people are familiar with it outside of Utah. I imagine they're not. Uh, I was part of SEO.com as an executive. Uh, another company called Perch, uh, which has gone through a name change since, but they owned 15 of the top 1,000 high traffic properties on the web. Yeah. Um, and a couple other things, but those are probably the ones that stand out the most. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really cool. cool. Um, and so it was, at Purple, I was the CMO and ran marketing and went from a team of myself, another consultant and an hourly employee to, you know, 45 plus and the con customer delight team, which was, you know, 80 to 100 people and uh, a lot of growth, a lot of, a lot of fun. Seriously, over those last few years, even just kind of watching it from from where I was at, uh, just to see the growth. I mean, I also knew Bryant and being able to communicate with him and just recognize just the rocket ship that you guys were on. Just yeah. amazing to watch. Brian was another big part. He was one of our first four employees mm -hmm. on the marketing team and mm -hmm. he contributed a lot. Yeah. With the success of Purple is, you know, comes a lot of notoriety, comes a lot of learning experiences. There's a lot that comes along with the success that you guys had, right? For better or worse, but mm -hmm. A lot you, of both. A lot of both. Put you in a good position. I, mean, I know you've done a lot of traveling. You've done a lot of speaking. You've done a lot of engagement stuff. Uh, how's that been? Is that new for you in your career or is that on um, par for what you've been doing over the last few years? Uh, ever since Orange Soda back in like 2006, I've been a part of the speaking circuit, mm -hmm. just networking. And mm -hmm. I've always believed in networking a lot. I feel like it's the difference between, you know, there's a lot of talented people, uh, but sometimes being able to communicate, networking, 
knowing the right people, yeah. it goes such a long way. So ever since about 2005, 2006, I've, I've leaned into that heavily and networked and spoke and, and done a lot more things That's very cool. to be out there. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons that I want to have you on the show again, Design Today, focusing on uh, applying some of these design practices to business, entrepreneurship, whatever it may be. Uh, I want to gain some of your insights. Uh, you're, you come from a design background, right? So that's the first time you approach me. I'm like, that's kind of funny. So I, I didn't know your angle at first. So uh -huh. again, most of my career, I've been in digital marketing. Right. Um, and over the last few years, I've, I've kind of morphed into a chief marketing officer and that's yep. where I'd, I hope to stay. Um, but I've never been a designer. I've relied on really talented people and I've learned what I like and don't like about certain, right. you know, angles that different designers take. But I do want to be clear. I am not a designer. <laughs> and I didn't mean that was, that was your opportunity to say I'm not a designer. Yeah. But that's OK, because what the angle that I want to talk about in the show today is, is that you have now collaborated with. Uh, dozens and dozens of designers, I assume, uh, at least at Purple, I knew that you've collaborated with tons of creatives. Uh, you've hired tons of creatives. I want to understand a little bit about what you deem some of those skills are that creatives need to have uh, to make themselves hireable or make themselves stand out. What are some of those skills that you've really uh, grown attracted to? Sure. And just for some context, before I get into that, you know, Purple's team had about maybe 12 to 15, depending on the, you know, the, the time, um, of creatives on our team. Yep. And, you know, we worked with Facebook's creative shop. They approached us about doing projects with them, which was yep. pretty awesome. YouTube approached us about doing collaborations. Um, you know, we worked with some really well-known, you know, strong creative agencies. So besides our own internal team, we learned a lot from some of the best out there. Sure. Absolutely. Um, in terms of what I look for and what I value the most, uh, flexibility, willing to adapt. You know, if you look at brands that are growing right now, you'll see that the big brands, the ones that are slowing down are not changing and they typically rely on agencies of record and that model's dying. You know, even agencies know that and they're trying yeah. to adapt and do things a little bit differently. The ones that I'm seeing uh, have the most success focus on being elite at a specific craft rather than mediocre at everything. Sure. Um, so for example, the Harmon brothers were a big part of purple story. They've released a lot of videos that have gotten a lot of attention yep. for many brands, yep. not just purple. Um, they are elite at their craft and you know, that's, we chose to work with them and that's a reason they're fantastic at what they do. And when purple hired people, um, we didn't just want somebody that had, you know, I'm decent at packaging. I'm decent at designing ads or, you know, other sorts of design work. We wanted people that were fantastic at what they did. Mm -hmm. um, did it have to be a broad spectrum? Um, not necessarily. In many cases, you know, we hired people that were great at one thing. Yeah. You know, there, there's a guy at Purple that is like, he's great at a lot of things, but his his passion was fonts. He yeah. loved fonts. Yeah. Um, you know, and because he had such passion around that, you know, Purple had great fonts, but he also, uh, you know, picked up skills and other things because the other people were great at other things, yeah. you know, so they all lifted each other up. Yeah. How did you empower someone who was good and, you know, specialized maybe in that font typography realm? How did you empower somebody like that in a, you know, a, a company the size of Purple? So, you know, luckily Purple went from nothing, you know, a couple of people to, you know, a thousand people, yeah. non-existent to you know, not raising venture capital money to half a billion in revenue. Right. Um, so because it changed so fast, it never was like a huge company where there was tons of red tape. Yeah. So our marketing team had a ton of flexibility. And if we brought somebody on, uh, like the font guy, for example, his name is Evan, by the way. Um, the font guy. Uh, yeah, hopefully he's not embarrassed by this. He's great at a lot of things. Yeah. But he was fan He's like really well known for, for you know, typography. Um so, you know, with, oh, I'm drawing a blank now. What was the question? Just about how you empower somebody. Oh, how do we empower specializes somebody? in something so specific. How do you empower that at, at, at a company of that size? So, you know, if somebody has a, an elite craft uh, at a small company where we're flexible and we're nimble, you know, that's, that's our only advantage is being more nimble than sure. Serta, Sealy, Simmons, these sure. huge mattress companies, Tempur-Pedic, uh, you know, our font guy could come in and say, Hey, I'm an expert on this. I'm going to present a plan to you. Mm -hmm. Right. And a big company that have to go through a process, put together a business case, you know, this, let's do this. We would just try things. Yeah. 
And that's what made Purple different. And that's why we grew quickly. Because yeah. if you imagine that across every tactic of marketing, you know, we're hiring really talented people, the best we could find in our area. Um, you know, we're, we're giving them freedoms to experiment. And I, I hope that most of the people, when, when they look back on their Purple journey, find that they had more freedom there than just about anywhere else they worked. That's cool. And it worked, right? I mean, it did. I mean, we made mistakes. There's some videos that we put out. There's some ads that we put out that were a disaster and you you won't see them, but we tried them. Yeah. We've hidden, hidden them since. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Part of any strategy you're going to fill at some point in time. Uh, One of the skills that you mentioned right out of the gate, you said flexibility. What does that look like? What are you talking about specifically when you say designer needs to have flexibility? So most creatives that I've, I've met, Um, and this is just my own personal experience. It doesn't mean I'm right. Sure. But you know, they have their own process and, you know, most creatives I've met, uh, at some point want to run their own creative shop and do things their own in their own way with their own process. Mm -hmm. Uh, when there's a team that's in a high growth mode and testing and learning, you have to break from that mindset and say, you know, yes, we care about the creative. Yes, we want it to look great. Yes, we want it to be appealing, but we also need to know that it's going to perform. And, you know, everybody looks at marketing and, and thinks of branding and performance yep. as two totally different worlds. And I think they mesh together a lot more than most people think. Yeah. I do think there's a need for specific performance and branding campaigns, but they do mesh together a lot. Um, so the flexibility to adjust, uh, you know, and early on, I mean, there were purple was not all perfect, but the performance team and the creative team battled many, many times. Uh-huh. Like this is going to drive sales. <laughs> they're like, we don't care if it drives sales. That's ugly. You know, and those are the things that we had to battle and find the happy medium on. So flexibility on everybody's part, not yeah. just creatives, yeah, yeah. but yeah. so as a team, as a whole, you're saying everyone had to be flexible. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm glad you bring that out because oftentimes I see designers that are coming in and they're interviewing for, you know, internship level or associate level. These, these, these people are coming out of school where they've taught a very rigid design process uh, you know and it for the most part it looks identical across the boot camps and the schooling it, it looks pretty identical but they get kind of slapped in the real world when they realize that now I'm at this company and this company doesn't do it the exact way that I learned it in school and they just like fireworks go off you know and it's just like I don't know what to do I, and they revert to like forgetting everything that they've ever learned or they just put their stake in the ground and they say, I'm not doing this. And they end up unhappy and they end up, uh, you know, eventually they'll end up leaving. But I think it's important that you point out that the flexibility you're talking about is that you're going to have different stakeholders in this process. You've got different teams, departments. Everyone's got to collaborate to get, you know, these greater results and being able to adapt. I think is kind of what you're speaking to. Am I right there? Definitely. Flexibility, you know, letting the best ideas win, you know, People just tend to revert back to what they learned. And this is the structure. I got to follow these three steps. And it, it, more and more of the brands that are winning do things differently and figure out their own process. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit about how much, uh, how involved were you? Probably more so in the early phases of Purple, but even in the past, how involved were you in hiring those creatives? Were you going through resumes and in the interviews and whatnot? Definitely. So from day one, you know, again, it was, uh, you know, I had one employee, his name was Matt Rogers, uh, and there was another consultant at the time as well. Um, and we started to build a team. Our first hire was JJ Goodwin. She was, you know, kind of our lead designer at the mm-hmm. time. And um, she's somebody I knew through my network. And uh, so early on, we needed somebody that could be very broad. Yeah. It, it goes, this is going totally counter to what I suggested before, where we want somebody to do everything really, really well. She, she did web design and graphic design and a lot but of different things. Somebody to fill yeah. m- many different hats. She had a very unique skill set that served, you know, many different hats. And over time we started to hire very specifically for certain roles yeah. as purple grew, of course, um, you know, as we were doing hundreds of millions of revenue, we became a public company within yep. that time frame as well. Things changed. We went from adding a creative director. I also had a, a chief brand officer within my team. Um, and so, yes, things changed where I wasn't at the very end hiring everybody. But early yeah. on, I was very adamant about the personalities and the type of people that we brought on. To so team. over your career, then you've seen a lot of resumes come across your desk. Tell me about some of the things that stand out in resumes, like, you know, either turn you on or turn you off right away. Hmm. So this might be counter to the question you're asking, but like resumes 
don't do it for me. Oh, like I'm so glad you just like said that. It, it's in person. It's always the vibe you get from the person. Oh, I'm so it's glad you how they react that. to what you say together. Yeah. And if you riff together well, like, I mean, rarely, you know, a lot of times that would get people in the door. For those uh, who are listening, I did not pay him to say that. <laughs> is that what you always say? Is this oh, your stint? Per- I think people are over optimizing resumes yeah. and they're ju- they're worried about like, how's my resume going to get past, you know, their software that's detecting keywords and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, holy smokes, a resume has never gotten me a job in my life. Yeah. Keep going. I interrupted you there. I'm just so, I, I want to point that because in fact, I just got off two phone calls, one today, one yesterday, talking about like, you know, can I count some of this project work as experience? Because, you know, I can't get through this resume round because I don't have the right amount of years of experience. I'm like, you're thinking way too much about your resume. Yeah. And I think what you need to be doing is having more conversations with real people to get your foot in the door. I'll, I'll say that in every one of the jobs that I've ever taken, I've gotten a foot in the door. And then before hiring, they say, Hey, we need a resume. And that's, Oh yeah, no problem. Here it is. I mean, you got to have one, right? Sure. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's always the magic when you're face to face or, I mean, even video conferences, you get, you can get a feel for people, but, um, you know, a resume has never sold me on, on, on anyone. Um, I, maybe I'll lose points by saying this, but like portfolio goes a long way for me. I like to look through the site and explore, especially for a creative. Um, so then let me ask you that same question then. So what sticks out in your mind when you're looking through somebody's portfolio? What, what really are you looking for? The attention to detail. Um, you know, a lot of portfolios are put together in a, you know, sometimes a sloppy way where it's like, we have two really great things, but I'm going to cram in these five other things so that it looks complete. Mm -hmm. And I don't just have two case studies or two Mm -hmm. examples or two pieces of work. Um, so, I mean, that's helped because then I can tell this person's got it together, but then again, there's always the outlier where we're going to find somebody that's young and only has one great piece of work that they've done. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's worth it to get to know them and meet them in person. But sometimes they do stand out because of their portfolio. Sure. Well, obviously they'll stand out enough for, for you to give them a call and have them bring it in. So you bring them in. And at that point in time, you're wanting to understand a little bit about their process. You're wanting to understand a little bit about how they work. Um, what types of things are you looking for maybe to hear or maybe to, uh, see like what type of body language, you know, what, what is it that once you get them in your soul on, that's the right person or it's not the right person. So I, I'm going to pick on a couple of our team members here. Sure. Uh, one is, is Dan Bischoff. He, he runs yep. couples performance marketing team yep. and he's a good friend. I love him. We've worked together many times. He's always really fun and, and throws people off in interviews. He's asked all kinds of crazy questions, like whether they believe in Bigfoot or not. And he has intentions behind their answer. Like Uh he wants to know what they think. Uh Um, And so I bring in, we rarely start out with like interview one, then you come and meet the team. Like we just bring the team. So I'd always bring in Dan and other people from different teams as well, because we want to see how the different groups get along. Mm-hmm. Uh, another person that was in a lot of these was Savannah Turk. She runs communications at, at Savannah Hobbs. Sorry, she's uh, uh, since married. Okay. Um, uh, you know, so she ran communications and social media at Purple. So bringing in this diversity, uh, you know, this different group of people rather than just the creative director, yeah. right? Um, that's going to hire a graphic designer. And all of a sudden you get these different perspectives. Because if just the creative team makes the hire, all they care about is what the creative team cares about. Sure. So I know this isn't revolutionary, but, um, you know, Dan and Savannah have different opinions. They care about the PR, the performance of the ads. And so right away, we kind of put them in this position of what it's going to be like daily. And that is, you know, there's a little bit of push push and pull, you know, with every decision that we make. So it's not just this perfect little, uh, creative world that they're interviewing in. It's already what it feels like to be a part of the team. Um, so that's what we looked for is somebody that could thrive within that team and different personalities that we had. So what is the purpose of asking somebody that they believe in Bigfoot? I, he just wanted to see how people would answer it. See if they squirm. Yeah. Cause most people like, like, what didn't want to say one way or the other. Uh Um, we just want to see, you know, where they stood and, and, and I always got the conversation going. I know there's no real purpose to it. Like there's sure. no yes or no, there's sure. nobody cared what they said, but we wanted to see how they dealt with it. And we're like, no, we want to know, do you believe in Bigfoot or not? And why? Uh-huh. And, uh, that always brought up really funny conversations. Because are you looking to see if like, I want to see they're goofy. I want to see that they they have an opinion, they're confident, or maybe they're, they have no opinion. They're, they're trying to look for facts. Like what, what is it? Exactly. I mean, everybody is prepared for 
you know, every design question they can answer. Sure. They're prepared to talk about the culture and their, you know, what drives them and mm -hmm. what motivates them. Mm -hmm. But you have to try to throw them off at least once in the interview just to see how they handle it. Yeah. You know, the people that just shrunk down for us, that was difficult because Purple's team was loud and, you know, we wanted people to be able to get their points across. You know, I've got uh, our um, chief of product at Domo. One of the things that she shared with me in a meeting a while back is she always said that she would ask some kind of fluffy questions that say something along the lines of like, you know, tell me about your favorite piece of technology, you know, yeah. coming to market right now. Not because they actually care about technology, but it's the same thing. Like yeah. what gets you excited? Or uh, if it's not really getting you excited, how are you going to answer this? You know, just to put them in a position where it's just like, think for yourself, think outside of this. And, uh, you know, how do you respond? One of the, uh, the metrics that she goes and grades by, she goes at the end of the interview, I want to know because of how much time we're going to spend together. She, one of her grading factors is if you and I were stuck in a foreign airport together and we're trying to make <laughs> it home, could we make it home, uh, in 24 hours? And will we make it home happily? Yeah. And I just thought that is such a good, you know, mindset to think about is, you know, you're not hiring somebody. Yes, they've got to have skills. It's a baseline. No doubt. You've got to have them fill a position. But outside of that, you need to find something that's going to be the right fit. You've mm -hmm. got teams, you've got people, and that's a real thing. And I'm sure you've been running across the experiences where, you know what, this person just isn't working in this environment and it's not conducive for anyone just talking about how important it is for for you to find the right people that are going to fit on the team because you run into those experiences where you, they just don't fit and now nobody's happy and yep. eventually somebody's got to move on nobody's doing their best work at that point in time yeah fit fit is just a yes or no i mean you can't hedge your bets on whether they fit in with the team or not. And that's again, why we brought in a diverse group of different team members from, you know, different departments within our marketing mm -hmm. group. And, uh, for, for us, you know, fit was, was the thing right off the bat that we was the priority with the questions. That's a Bigfoot thing, all these things. We want to understand how people are going to respond and, yeah. and deal with our sense of humor. And yeah. so, yeah, there, there's no hedging around dealing with fit. Are you ever interested to see, you know, are these designers, um, you know, what are they doing outside of their full-time job? You know, what brings them happiness? What brings them passion? What, what are they doing to refine their skills? Like, is that ever of interest to you? Um, I think so. Um, a lot of people think I'm more creative than I'm, than I am due to what purple has done over the last few years. And, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm honored by that, but the honest truth is we had a great creative team mm -hmm. and they were so different than me. Yeah. Um, and watching them, I've learned to try to not understand creatives. <laughs> um, you know, we have a, a guy that's built a custom van. We have, uh, you know, all kinds of different personalities uh -huh. there. So they do very different things, but I am, you know, purple has been through quite a few different CEOs yeah. over the, the three years that I've been there. And a couple of them were not advocates of people working outside of purple on other projects. Yeah. And I I love that if people want to create, keep their creative juices flowing and experiment with different things, I think that's a benefit to purple. So I love to see that people love their craft enough that, you know, one project isn't enough for them. Yes. Purple is their full-time job. Um, yes. We want a vast majority of their attention, but I love people that are driven enough to expand and broaden their horizons and try different things. So I yeah. look for people that love their craft enough. That they're not burnt out at the end of the day and they don't ever want to think about it again. Yeah. So now you've since left purple mm -hmm. and you're out venturing into new territory, right? Yep. So I'm consulting with quite a few companies right now. Uh, again, I just left a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm not prepared to announce what I'm going to do, but I'm sure. having a lot of fun helping with quite a few things. Now imagine at this point in time, you're going to get hands on at a company and you're going to start, I don't want to say start at the bottom again, but you're going to start building again. So I assume interviews with creative start to happen over again. And you start to go through this process again, right? For sure. I mean, uh, I love early stage. I love building things. Um, so yes, I expect to go through the same process again and try to leverage what I learn. And you know, what I learned at purple was again, hire the right fit, the right team and take, take calculated, educated risks. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're going to do. Is there anything you want to do different this time around than in past rodeos, you know? 
Oh man, that's tough. I mean, the hard thing is, you know, purple was, as far as I can tell, it was the fastest consumer brand in Utah ever. Yeah. Um, uh, that's such a cool thing to be able to say. I might be wrong, but as far as I can tell, sure. Um, I don't want to look back and second guess what we did. Yeah. Um, you know, all the team members I love is, is friends, whether that's professional or not, they're just great people. So I don't, I don't want to second guess anybody that we hired or anything that we did. Now, let me ask if you, I could learn from it, is that what you're sure. asking? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this and maybe it's not that you want to change, but then do you think you found like the magic sauce and what you guys did at purple that you want to repeat? There, there are definitely some things I want to repeat. I mean, if, if I'm a hundred percent honest, you know, there was a lot of great timing to purple, you know, others, there were many entrants into the mattress industry before yeah. purple had already educated people that you could buy a mattress online. Yeah. Luckily we had great differentiation and we leaned into that. Um, but yeah, there is some secret sauce and I think that's, you know, speed to market moving quickly, uh, you know, testing things quicker than your competition, uh, having creative that breaks through the noise, yeah. all of those things added up together, give you a huge advantage. Most companies are not going to run fast. They're going to get stuck in their own minds. You know, the, you know, the CEO and the CMO aren't going to get along and, you know, they're going to, you know, just struggle to make decisions. Sure. If you can, luckily I'll always be so grateful to the, the founders of purple because they let our marketing team run. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of oversight. They, they were fantastic. That's awesome. Um, so, you know, I think those couple things, you know, flexibility, testing and learning quickly, uh, creative that breaks through the clutter, you know, again, just to reiterate, I think those things, most companies will never figure out. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, I appreciate you coming on the show, Alex. That's, uh, that's about it for our time here today. But, um, I think some of those takeaways, you know, specifically, uh, with the flexibility and how we try and find the right fit. I mean, I think a lot of designers need to understand some of those concepts, you know, it's not all about, uh, just the hard skills that you're going to pick up. And when you're in school, uh, you know, I think it is a baseline. Yes. You do need to have a resume. Yes. You do need to have a portfolio. Yes. You do need to know how to operate in some of these you know, software tools. Uh, but from our conversation today, I'm guessing that you would venture to say that it's a lot more than just those foundation points. It's a lot more about personality. It's a lot more about the soft skills. Uh, I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but that's what I'm picking up. I on. think you picked up on some of the things I'm trying to communicate. Um, and, and again, to emphasize what I said earlier on, like get elite at something, you know, be just world-class at something or get into the community where you can learn from, from a different group or, uh, you know, find a, just a really niche audience that's elite at something and, and be a part of that group. And you'll learn to do something different than, you know, the way other people are perceiving it or, or doing it right now. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I sound so sick. I've been sick for the last <laughs> two days and I'm just realizing how nasal I sound. But. Oh, it's fine. Uh, okay. We're going to wrap it right there. All right. Thanks so much, Alex. Appreciate Thanks. it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.